Number 10, the printing press. The printing press was the first of many media, changing the way we collect, store, retrieve, critique, discover, and promote information. It participated in the Reformation, the Renaissance, and the Scientific Revolution. History tells us that Johannes Gutenberg invented the first printing press in Europe's Western civilization. Olive and wine screw presses have been known to have existed in Europe since the time of the ancient Romans. Other presses for the binding of handwritten books were also in use. Gutenberg was the first to transform the concept of printing by introducing its invention to the printing world. Who would have thought that introducing a screw into the works could have such an amazing effect on speed? The use of mechanical presses, along with other innovations on behalf of Gutenberg, revolutionized printing and made it somewhat of an industrial process. The output of his machine was something unheard of at the time. Papers and books can now be produced in a cheaper way, reach more people, and do all of that faster than ever before, thanks to mechanization. Naturally, this turned into the standard and preferred way of printing. Before the invention of the printing press, everything happened very slowly, but the game was changed for good. People just couldn't compete with the aforementioned machine and copyist, regardless of their experience and skill. It could never match the output of their mechanical counterpart. As soon as the printing press was introduced, the game was over. Number 9. Modern Plumbing Imagine what the world would be like if there was no way to remove sewage and introduce fresh water to the densely populated areas. First of all, everything would look different than it already is just because the concept that we have about what a city must look like would be impossible to achieve. Tall buildings will be out of the question. Just try to wrap your head around how much water a population of metropolis will need on a daily basis. If somehow you were able to provide the necessary H2O, sadly, your troubles are just beginning. Why, you might ask? Well, if your body is in need of hydration and then it receives it, it's just a matter of time before it goes through your system, and after doing its job, it will need to exit somehow. Now you're in trouble. The good thing is that thanks to modern plumbing, all of the delivery and removal of used water can happen almost instantaneously when we all have the water at our disposal. Thanks to plumbing, we are able to bring comfort and beauty to our way of life due to the fact that we are able to use water in several key areas of our own home, like the kitchen and bathroom. All of this happens without a thought of what it would have been like if we hadn't invented pipes and the way to move water back and forth so we can have it at our fingertips at all times. The possibility of not being able to wash your hands after using a toilet? Grow. Number 8. Pesticides Since 2500 BC, humans have used pesticides to prevent damage to their crops. The first known pesticide was an elemental sulfur powder used in Samaria about 4500 years ago. By the 15th century, toxic chemicals such as arsenic, mercury, and lead were being applied to crops for purposes of pest control. In 1939, Paul Mueller discovered that DDT was an extremely effective solution for dealing with insects that were bringing harm to the crop. It quickly became something that was used all over the globe for being so effective. However, in the 1960s, it was discovered that DDT was disrupted to the reproduction of many species of birds that were fish eaters and that was a big warning sign that was endangering the biodiversity. Science did what it could, and different substances began to be produced and took the place of DDT in the agricultural sector. With the passing of time, pesticides became less and less harmful for humans and more potent and more protective of the crops. Since the 1950s, the usage of so-called field chemistry has grown around 50 times, and nowadays we use 2.5 million tons of pesticides every year. As long as the chemicals are safe for human consumption and are not harmful to animals and they don't pollute the soil and poison the water, I guess we'll be all right. Science has done so much for the well-being of humankind. Let's just hope that in the future, it will come up with an eco-friendlier way of protecting the crops that we all rely on. And now for number seven. But first, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss out on more videos like these. Number seven, the automobile. The first self-propelled vehicle was invented by the French mechanic Nicolas Joseph Cugno. However, it ran on steam, and as revolutionary as it was, it wasn't quite fit for the widespread use due to its price and bulky design. It was an important beginning that begged for further development. In 1885, Carl Benz designed and built the world's first practical car with an internal combustion engine. Things were slowly but surely crawling towards the image of the automobile of today that we all use in our daily lives. But we weren't quite there yet. In 1885, Gottlieb Daimler developed the internal combustion engine even further and patented what is widely recognized as the pioneer of the modern gas engine, and later built the world's first four-wheeled vehicle. 
So basically, the modern automobile has been evolving since the end of the 19th century, and by the looks of things, it isn't planning to stop anytime soon. Engines are getting more and more efficient and powerful. Nowadays, cars get out of the factory with engines capable of producing 3 to 400 horsepower, something that was unthinkable back in the day. Old sports cars didn't have the characteristics like these, and the whole automotive industry doesn't even show signs of slowing down, not even one bit. We have started to produce electric vehicles that are capable of a non-polluting way of travel while electric motors within them can produce mind-blowing torque and HP figures. So we started with steam, and then later on we tried internal combustion engines. Now we're experimenting with electric cars. What does the future hold? Do you think in 20 years we'll have flying cars? Let me know in the comments. Number 6. The Steam Engine In 1698, an English military engineer and inventor by the name of Thomas Savory patented the first crude system machine, while in 1712, Thomas Newcomen invented the atmospheric steam engine. The steam engine marked the beginning of the Industrial Revolution thanks to the efforts of James Watt. He perfected the steam engine by coming up with something simple yet brilliant. A centrifugal regulator kept the engine running at the desired speed, and the whole thing is such a simple and elegant modification of a well-known concept that it can easily be crowned as one of the best ideas of all time. An upgrade to the steam engine started a whole new era in the development of mankind. Trains, machines, steam everywhere. What if everything was still powered by steam? Can you even imagine what our society would look like under the steampunk title? Other than looking cool, we would have a heck of a hard time to breathe. Imagine being stuck in traffic with everyone around you dumping coal in their steam engine. It might look cool, but it certainly would be harmful to the environment. However primitive the steam engine was, it did set in motion things that changed the way our world worked, looked, and traveled. It was an important step to which we owe a lot. Next up for science, teleportation device. Who knows, it might just have been inspired by the steam engine. Number 5. Transistors the transistor is the basic building block of circuits that controls the operation of computers, mobile phones, and all other modern electronic devices. On December 16, 1947, William Shockley, John Bardeen, and Walter Brain succeeded in building the first practical transistor in Bell's lab. This work followed them from their wartime efforts to produce an extremely pure geranium crystalline mixing diodes used in radar units as a frequency mixing element in microwave radar receivers. Nowadays, transistors are used in all kinds of circuit boards. The smaller they are, the better. A tiny invention like this one opened the doors for technology that otherwise would be either unthinkable or so big and impractical that it could never be reached at mass market. High-end integrated circuits of computer processors can literally use a million or more transistors on a single chip. Most desktops also have several gigabytes of memory chips that require a billion more transistors Plus, your peripheral chips can take millions more in addition. If there were no transistors, we wouldn't have computers, which sounds horrible, and we wouldn't have gotten as far as we did as a species without their help. Such a tiny invention that brought an amazing array of technology along with it. Number 4. The Computer The analytic engine was a brainchild of Charles Babbage way back in 1837. It was the first conceptualized design a fully programmable mechanical computer. Due to an unstable financial situation and an inability to resist design adjustment, Babbage never actually managed to build his analytical machine. Automatic, large-scale punch card data processing was performed for the U.S. Census in 1890 through tabulation machines designed by Herman Hollerith and produced by Computing Tabulating Recording Corporation, which later became IBM. Fascinating, right? A concept that was not even prototyped due to insufficient funds that led to the creation of the pocket computers that we all carry around with us today. Have you seen the purchase cards that I mentioned earlier? Do you know how many of them were needed to store four or five megabytes? The answer might surprise you. You would need exactly 62,500 cards to be able to write this data down. Things have changed a lot, haven't they? Today, we have thumb-sized flash drives capable of storing terabytes upon terabytes of data and whatnot. Our computers can communicate with each other and with space via satellite. Imagine what the world would be today if back in 1837, Mr. Babbage somehow was able to fund and build his machine. We might be flying from planet to planet by now for vacation or a honeymoon. Would you take a vacation to another planet? Let me know in the comments. Number 3. Plastic Plastics are made up of organic condensing or admixture polymers that may contain other substances to improve performance or economy. 
There are a few natural polymers that are usually considered plastics. The first synthetic polymer-based plastic was made from phenol and formaldehyde, the first viable and inexpensive synthesis methods being invented by Leo Hendrik Bakeland in 1909. The product was known as Bakelite. Subsequently, polyvinyl chloride, polyestrian, polythene, polypropylene, polyester, acrylics, silicone, and polyurethanes are among the varieties of plastics developed and have had a great commercial success. Plastic is the gift and punishment of our time. Easy to manufacture, light and durable, it's used on almost every aspect of our modern lives. The downside of plastic is that it can't recycle itself in nature and it's one of the biggest pollutants of the ocean. Scientists are developing new kinds of biodegradable plastic that can help the environment cope with the extra pollution by itself. When will this plastic enter mass production? Only time will tell. Until then, please be a bit more considerate when you use plastics and make sure to dispose of it in the proper way. With a great invention like this one comes great responsibility, and we all owe it to nature to do our best to recycle as much as we can. Number two, how to harness electricity. Electricity existed all the time, but the system of devices needed to generate this power and distribute it to individual buildings was an invention originally launched by Edison. It effectively made electricity a commodity, and as Pearl Street Station was the first power station in the world, Nikola Tesla's invention of alternating current, AC, made it possible to transmit electricity over long distances, leading to the national grid we know today. Now everyone in the West, and in most countries around the world, can take advantage of the network to power everything from light bulbs to computers. If you look at it from a different perspective, mankind has assumed control over a force of nature. We all know how dangerous electricity is and what it can do to the human body. The fact that we have found a way to tame it and use it for our own purposes, that's something. If somehow we lost control over electricity, we would need to go back to the ancient ways of having fun, which including throwing rocks in a river or digging holes in the ground. Have you ever dug a hole in the ground with your bare hands? Kids today surely do not do that. Electricity might just be the answer to the fossil fuel crisis that we are now facing. Could it be that the thing we were looking for all along was right in front of our very eyes? Number one, vaccines and antibiotics. Three centuries ago, almost everyone having an infectious disease was considered a goner. When the plague exploded in 1347, it wiped out nearly half of the population of Europe in just two years. When diseases like smallpox arrived in North America, they reduced indigenous populations by about 90% in a century. As early as the 1800s, tuberculosis was the main problem in the West. Almost no one reached old age at that time. That's one reason why elders were honored. Today, elderly people are everywhere. Nothing unusual about surviving more than 70 years. Modern medicine is the reason behind all of that. If it wasn't for immunizations and antibiotics, none of this would be possible. We have come so far in our development as a species that we have found a way to artificially prolong our lives, maintain our bodies, and overcome some of the things that nature throws at us. We definitely have science to thank for that. At one point, we might totally isolate aging as a factor. Some genius might invent a pill that will keep us young forever. The possibilities are endless, and we only have more amazing things to look forward to. Number 10, Ford Motor Company. In 1903, Alexander J. Malcolmson decided to start a car company alongside Henry Ford. Malcolmson spoke to some people and got positive responses from 12 investors. One of them was his uncle, John Gray, who invested $10,500 in the company. Keep in mind that this was happening at the beginning of the 20th century, and that was a serious amount of money for that time. Although Gray was not around when the fruits of his investment got ripe for the picking. His heirs greatly benefited by the investment decision of their family member, though. When Ford bought the shares from investors in 1919, they made a whopping $26.25 million. This is 2,500 times the return on your initial investment. If I had to adjust the amount with inflation today, it would be about $1.8 billion. So yeah, there is something special in people that can view potential and invest when the time is right. John Gray was one of them, and he made the right call at the right time. The returns down the road were humongous, and everyone involved benefited from the decision well taken. Number 9. Coca-Cola Coca-Cola has been named one of the most valuable brands in the world, and probably will hold that position for many more years to come. And with good reason. I doubt that even a single person exists on the planet that's never heard of it. 
However, the company is not responsible for the creation of the world-famous beverage, but a pharmacist by the name of John Stith Hemburton, who unintentionally created the recipe that we all know and love today. Who would have thought it would have played out the way that it did? Pemberton was a Civil War officer, and experimental treatment of an injury led to the discovery of what we know today as Coca-Cola. He did not become rich and famous from selling his creation himself. He tried to market it, but things were going slow, and the revenue was not worth the investment of effort that Pemberton was conducting. Years later, after trying as hard as he could and not receiving the results he wanted, he sold it in 1891 to Asa Chandler for $2,300. After holding on to the recipe for quite a while, Chandler sold it in 1923 for $25 million. This profit is an amazing return on a relatively small investment. Looking at things from the perspective of time, if Chandler knew what Coca-Cola would become, he might have aimed even higher than $25 million. For better or worse, the recipe was sold and all of you can now enjoy a symbol of a whole generation in the form of a refreshing carbonated drink. Number 8. Facebook Facebook is, as we all know, the social media behemoth of our time. However, a while back, no one even imagined that a small networking website, which was the creation of a few Harvard students, would develop into what it is now. If one of the original investors, Peter Thiel, had just a little bit better foresight, he might have came even more on top than he actually did. I'm not saying he made the wrong call, just that if he invested more, he would have received more. In 2005, he chipped in 500,000 in the company, and lo and behold, in 2012, what he got out of it was around 800 times the amount of his initial investment. He was able to acquire this amazing amount of money by selling the 25 million shares of Facebook that he owned for $400 million. Maybe an idea worth investing in is waiting just around the corner. Who knows, maybe one day you will be featured in a list of successful investors that followed their dreams. And now for number seven. But first, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss out on more videos like these ones. Number seven, McDonald's. McDonald's is not just a part of the fast food industry, it has become a synonym of the American culture itself. Many people don't know that the company first started selling hot dogs, not hamburgers. And through an amazing amount of changes and efforts, it turned itself into the fast food giant that we all know today. It feeds around 68 million people every single day. Few people know the story of Ray Kroc, who made an investment in the company of 2.7 million in 1961. The McDonald brothers were helped for many years to be able to franchise the restaurant. In the end, it was all worth it. Mr. Kroc earned an amazing return for his investment in 1984 that came close to $500 million. This is an example of how a timely investment and an amazing amount of hard work brought an incredible gain down the road. Imagine starting with a small drive through restaurant in 1975 and working your way up the global fast food chain selling 75 burgers per second. All of this wouldn't have been possible without the investment that made it all happen. Thank you, Mr. Kroc, for one of the biggest culture phenomenons of the 20th century. Number 6. eBay Who is the leader of the global e-commerce industry nowadays? If you said Amazon, you're absolutely right. However, eBay is in no way giving up and it's closely following its competitor. It's constantly developing business ideas that will help their development. They have their sights set in the future of technology and decided that it would be wise to make investments in automatous machines and artificial intelligence to be exact. Smart Capital had a clear understanding of the future needs of this e-commerce giant back in 1995 and it made $6.7 million of investment. Later on, the company's value rose to over $5 billion, and all that happened in just a short span of only four years. If back in the day you were into stocks, shares, and intelligent investments, this opportunity is the one that probably got away. In 1998, the shares of eBay were selling for only $18 each. If you were considerate enough to have invested in the website that was making its baby steps at the time, nowadays you would have gotten $84,000 for making the right decision. During the dot-com boom, many companies made risks and a lot of them suffered huge losses. That wasn't the case with eBay. The website secured its positions, stabilized its stocks, and turned itself into one of the world's most profitable websites. Only 22 years after its creation did all of this happen. You can Google it if you wish. Number 5. Google Back in 1999, Sequoia Capital and Clinier Perkins Caulfield & Byers funded Google with $12.5 million each. Google was having a rough time, and the frequent ups and downs that the company was going through 
were not making it easy for them to keep a firm hold on its investors. When the company decided to go with the initial public offerings in 2004, what both of the investors received skyrocketed in value to around 300 times more to roughly $4.3 billion each. Everyone knows the situation with Google, but like every company, it had its fair share of bad times and uncertainties, and thankfully for us, it was able to pull through. Some of the right investments in 1999 paved the way for the creation and development of one of the biggest companies in the world. Number four, Xiaomi. In 2018, Xiaomi went public with an IPO that was valued at an amazing 54 billion. Their investors were more than happy to become witness to the metamorphosis that turned their company of interest into the world's biggest smartphone manufacturer. The biggest beneficiary of what was going on was Morningside Ventures. They earned back 40 times their original investment. After taking the time to calm down and evaluate the situation, they found out that what they did turned out to be the most successful investments that the company had ever gone forward with. It's not surprising that someone got their investment back, considering the fact that the target itself was smartphones. Everyone uses them, and there's no sign of fatigue in the gaining of their popularity. I doubt that we will stop using those connected rectangles anytime soon. What is amazing here is the crazy amount that was made in profit. Who wouldn't invest if certain that the investment will be insanely profitable? I guess not paying attention in those economics classes Played a bad joke on all of us. If only we listened, had a disposable income, and had billions of dollars and an education that would help us make the right call. Number three, Spotify. When Spotify was in need of a financial injection to be able to keep growing, Crendon stepped in to help. The company made an investment of 4.5 million with the agreement that they will receive a 6% stake of equity. All of this happened when Spotify was still on its way to becoming the modern internet giant that we know it as. In 2018, when it was decided that the right path for the company was the one of the initial public offering, the stake was valued at $370 million. The return on the initial investment was around 80 times the original value. After realizing exactly how much they got, Kingdom closed its offices and all the employees partied like there is no tomorrow. Number 2. GitHub A lot of people that owned shares in the industry back in 2012 spoke out against the decision of Andreessen Horowitz to make a huge investment of $100 million in something called GitHub. What happened next made history because it fell into the category of the biggest U.S. venture-backed acquisitions in the past decade. You can already guess that someone with an interest in the developing e-technology made a huge purchase. If you said Microsoft, then your guess was correct. The software giant paid the crazy amount of $7.5 billion for GitHub in 2018. After what happened, the same people that spoke openly against the decision remained as silent as they could. We all know why, and we are certain who is smiling now. The game of the people in the stock market is on a totally different level. No one bothers to play it safe and small. They rush in after making informed decisions, and they win big. You have to have nerves of steel to risk an amount that you have no way of making in a couple lifetimes, at least from a normal person's point of view. What would you do with so much money? What would you spend it on? Let me know in the comment section. Number 1. L.me We all know that Alibaba is nowadays an e-commerce giant, but Alibaba wanted to be like Meituan and Tencent, a leader in the brick-and-mortar delivery space. The multinational conglomerate company decided that they are going to take a big risk in 2016 by investing $1.25 billion in a local delivery startup called L.me. The company was going against competitors that had a strong foothold in the market. The all-in bet was more than a success, and soon the startup started to grow with an amazing rate and was handling the orders of around 40 million customers. The generated income from orders was a whopping $9.5 million per day. There might be a good reason why ordinary people like us don't have access to money of that caliber. It wouldn't take long before we make some ridiculously stupid purchases. Number 10. Amazon was only a bookstore. These days, you can find anything on Amazon. You can even buy a house and the required home appliances to go with it. Like everything else, Amazon started humbly. It was open for business in 1995, and its main purpose was to sell books. There was another thing you could have found if you went to the site, and that was compact CDs with music on them. But they weren't the intended primary focus. Before Jeff Bezos decided to expand until 1998, the main goods that were traded were hard copy novels. In 1998, Amazon acquired Jung Lee Corporation, an e-commerce and software company that possessed software for a comparison of prices and also an online marketplace. In 1998, Jung Lee was what Amazon is in 2020. 
Bezos also bought an address book and social networking site with 1.5 million users called Planet All. The icing on the cake was the announcement that from now on, third-party vendors were allowed to conduct business through the website. And as they say, the rest is history. Number 9. WhatsApp was something different WhatsApp's founders, Jan Coombe and Brian Acton, were unaware that they had created a messaging app when they released the first version in 2009. Just two years earlier, the two future billionaires quit their jobs at Yahoo to tour South America. During that time, they applied for a job at Facebook but were unable to make the cut. In January 2009, Coombe acquired an iPhone. Then he thought of creating an application that would allow people to have a status update next to their names. The idea was to allow people to send information to potential callers about what was happening to them. However, it never caught on and Coombe even considered giving up for a while. WhatsApp became a success only after Apple announced push notifications in June 2009. Push notifications allowed users to receive instant notifications every time someone changed their status. Coombe realized that WhatsApp users often updated their statuses to communicate with each other as if they were instant messages. He returned to the drawing board and WhatsApp version 2.0 was released shortly after. WhatsApp became the most used application for messaging people in 109 countries. People were sending messages, images, videos, and even voice recordings over the internet instead of using their mobile network. That was an ideal solution for iPhone users who wanted to interact with Android users and vice versa. The best thing about it is it's free and hopefully it will remain free down the road. No one has yet confirmed that, but just imagining the backlash of an announcement that states the service will become pay to use is enough to discourage any possible attempts. Great news for anyone who wants to communicate via the internet. Number 8. Flickr Chat Room Really? Flickr was founded in 2004 by Stuart Butterfield and Katarina Fake. The creators always wanted Flickr to be an image sharing and hosting site, but the initial plan included a feature that had nothing to do with them. The original idea was a designated place that allowed users to chat. The future Flickr website was shown and open to the public at the O'Reilly Emerging Tech Conference in San Diego on the 10th of February in 2004. The development process of Flickr was far from over, and it was not even intended as the main product. The hopes and dreams of Stuart and Katarina laid in a virtual game called Game Never Ending. Flickr was nothing but a thing on the side. The couple decided later on to direct users' attention to the photo sharing and hosting program as soon as its potential was discovered. Sadly, their game was stuck in development hell and the idea was abandoned, along with the chatroom feature of the website. Whatever they did, it must have been the right call because, as we all know, Flickr did spread like wildfire, and its future is surely only to get brighter. And now for number seven. But first, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss out on more videos like these. Number 7. Wikipedia Revenue Through Ads Wikipedia is an online storage site with information on everything under and above the sun. You'll find almost everything there. Even other encyclopedias that have existed for centuries do not match the deposit of information. Wikipedia owes its success to its users. Regular people, not employees, created all the content for free. But the lack of internal writers does not mean that Wikipedia does not have to deal with expenses. You need to pay your developers, host, and finance some other operating expenses. You can't avoid lawsuits when you run a website like Wikipedia. That means that Wikipedia has to make some money. The founders, Jimmy Wells and Larry Sanger, plan to generate money from paid ads, the kinds of things you see almost on every website today. Jimmy and Larry hope to earn enough to cover salaries and web hosting, even if they didn't make a profit. Fortunately for information seekers, Wikipedia took the non-profit route when the singer left in 2002. Thank goodness for Wikipedia, right? Number 6. Facebook – The Picture Comparer Way back in 2003, Mark Zuckerberg created a website that was named Facemash. Think of it as the forefather of Facebook. The site asked its users to give their opinion on which of the two photos showed on the screen was cooler. To get a hold of users, Zuckerberg used the Harvard University database in a shady way to get a hold of students' ID pictures. The whole operation was online for only several days before the university found out what was happening and pulled the plug. Mark was going to be kicked out of the university, but thankfully the charges were dropped. Zuckerberg did not give up on his dream, and a couple of months later, he created another site now bearing the name The Facebook. It copied the face mash recipe, but also allowed users to meet new people there was no trace left of the photo comparison feature. As its predecessor, FaceMash, the Facebook was only for internal usage of the Harvard University students, but then moved on to a larger audience and ultimately became the social media behemoth that we all know today. Everyone and their grandma has a Facebook. 
Number five, Twitter was pay per tweet. What do you pay for Twitter? Twitter is a microblogging system based on sending and receiving short publications called tweets. They can contain a maximum of 140 characters and can include links to sites. Twitter users follow other users. If you follow someone, you can see their tweets on your timeline on Twitter. You can choose to follow people and organizations with academic and personal interests similar to yours. You can create your own tweets or retweet information tweeted by others. Retweeting means that information can be shared quickly and effectively with a large number of people. Now that we got that out of the way, let's jump to the interesting part. Back when it was founded in 2006, it was just TWTTR. It was still pronounced the same way we do today though. The idea for this online service came from Jack Dorsey, even though later on, several other people came on board as co-founders. The initial idea of Twitter was a social media platform whose updates worked via short message service. It wasn't long before Twitter encountered problems that came from this business model. Workers at a podcasting business called Odeo were the beta testers of the app, and they were stunned that the addictive nature of the website messaging system destroyed their phone bills and racked them up into the hundreds. Who would have thought that if you send enormous amounts of messages, you will get a nasty surprise at the end of the month? One person was charged $400 for SMS messages in one month. The SMS model was clearly not the answer for this new web platform, and it was quite heavy on the pocket. So before the initial launch of the website, the messaging system switched to an all-web program model. Imagine they had to pay for each individual tweet. That would be madness. Number four, eBay started because of candy. The whole idea for eBay started around 1994, when its founder, Pierre Almadiar, got acquainted with his soon-to-be wife, Pamela Wesley. His lady of choice was a passionate collector of Pez dispensers. If you have no idea what we're talking about, Pez is a type of candy. The dispenser itself is a small contraption that delivers candy on demand. Miss Wesley complained to her future husband that she had a hard time finding people who are willing to sell or part with their dispensers. Mr. Omidyar started thinking about how he could help Pamela with her problem, and in 1995, he figured it out. He decided to install a small area for shopping on his personal website. His wife was really excited and started using it immediately so she can refresh her collection, and not long after, other collectors followed her example. The interesting thing that happened was that Mr. Omidyar noticed that many people started using his designated trading area, and they were not selling only dispensers, but all sorts of stuff. Half a year later, the shopping website thingy was worth three billion and had more than two million active users. Things rapidly snowballed out of proportion and the whole operation was moved to the site that today we know as eBay. Nowadays, eBay is a market in which millions of people trade on a daily basis. Some are buyers, some are sellers, and some are both. The beauty of eBay lies in the power of the market. An item is only worth what someone is willing to pay for it. This can mean very high prices for many sought after items, such as collectibles, discontinued items, antiques, unusual items, or something in short supply. For example, when Twinkies were temporarily discontinued, smart eBay sellers bought and sold them at an incredible price. Does this sound strange to you? It's all about supply and demand. And to think that it all started due to the frustration of a Pez collector. So thank you, Pamela. Number three, Instagram was for appointments. Instagram was founded by Kevin Systrom and Mike Krager in 2010. It was not the social networking site for photo sharing as we know it today. It wasn't even called Instagram. The name was Bourbon after Bourbon Whiskey. The naming wasn't random at all. Systrom, who founded Bourbon himself, loved Bourbon Whiskey and thought it great to name his product after. In addition, the name paired well with its purpose. Bourbon was built to plan meetings. Users can check in anywhere they visit, make plans with friends to visit the place in the future, and then post photos of the meeting. Bourbon soon failed because it was too complicated to use. Meanwhile, Systrom noted that users were often more interested in sharing photos from their meetings than using the other features. He brought Mike Krager on board, and they both developed what would later become the Instagram of today. The duo planned on Instagram to be something between Facebook and Hiptasmatic, which were the two major photo sharing sites at the time. Hiptasmatic had good filters but terrible ability to share photos. Facebook was just the opposite, and Instagram would be both. Now you have an idea as to why Instagram has such a clean and easy to use interface, and there's no denying that you either love it or you hate it. Systrom also did not forget the lesson he learned from Bourbon's failure. He made sure Instagram was as simple as possible. To do this, everything else with the exception of photo sharing, commenting, and liking tools was removed from Bourbon. Number two, FaceTime, the Mac problem solver. Some Apple staff was assembled in 2007 by Robert Garcia to develop a program with the codename Venice. 
It was supposed to give iPhone users the ability to make voice calls with the help of their Apple computers. The program experienced technical difficulties and the team responsible for it moved on to other things. A year later, Garcia combined what was left of the program into GameKit, which was an iPhone program that gave users the opportunity to video chat during online gaming. He and his team hit the bullseye this time. Later down the road, the video chat feature was made into a standalone program that millions of people like and use today, the so-called FaceTime. After some polishing, the final product was ready and the application supported video and audio calls between Apple devices, while not replacing your regular telephone calls, but provided as an alternative. Apple's FaceTime application worked with Wi-Fi, so one of the main advantages it had over your regular phone app was that you could make free internet-based calls anywhere you have Wi-Fi. You could use FaceTime from your home, hotel, restaurant, or any Wi-Fi hotspot without the need for quality mobile service. In the end, a solution to a problem turned into a great tool for people that wanted to remain connected to the people they love by an assortment of devices. You never know how things are going to play out, and in this case, it worked out great. Number 1. Dating Through YouTube Today, YouTube is a place for videos for just about anything. It was first designed as a platform to allow consumers to meet future spouses at the time it was launched in 2005. Its founders, Jod Karim, Steve Chen, and Chad Hurley, wanted users to upload a video discussing what they wanted in a potential partner. In accordance with their intentions, the slogan, Tune in and hook up, was used as the catchphrase for the website. However, no one even tried to upload a video. Even when the founders offered to give $20 to every woman who did so, there was no response at all. The people behind YouTube later decided to allow people to upload all kinds of videos, and it worked. People went crazy. Who would have thought it would turn into this? Thanks for watching. Do you believe any of these websites would have had a chance if they didn't change? Let me know in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.